This book is a beautiful travel guide about Paris. This book was very well organized and gave me a very good understanding of Paris. To use a quote of yours, this book caters to both the physical traveler and the armchair explorer. The practical tips for those on the ground are balanced with lots of fascinating information on Paris, so you don't need to be there to plunge into the history, imagine the events that shaped the city, and discover the iconic and more quirky buildings and places around Paris. It's packed with color photos, websites to look up, many of which offer interactive experiences, and you can even have fun following the walking tours virtually via Google Maps or Google Earth. Allure, the Musée Boubien, wherever you are, your quote perfectly describes your book, The Architecture Lover's Guide to Paris. Hi, I'm Paul from Trending, Who, What, Where, and When. Today I will be speaking with multiple book author Ruby Bukabu about her newest book, The Architecture Lover's Guide to Paris. Ruby will be joining us from Sydney, Australia. Bonjour, I'm Ruby and I'm the author of The Art Lover's Guide to Paris and also The Architecture Lover's Guide to Paris, which is literally hot off the press and on its way to booksellers around the globe. So, I'm part-time Parisian and I wrote these books for anyone inspired by Paris's incredible history, culture, places and artists, both past and present. It caters to people who are reminiscing about past Paris trips. It has the practical information and tips for anyone dreaming up future adventures, but it's also very much for the armchair traveller with history, anecdotes, there's virtual walking tours you can do through the book or virtually, and also a couple of hundred photos that I took all sorts. Right now, however, I'm back home in my other home in Australia, just north of Sydney near the Hawkesbury River. It's an amazing place to come and think, to stroll by the river, to go on boat trips, have picnics, and of course to write. So while I do that, I really hope that you will be intrigued and invigorated by these books. And really, you don't need to be planning a trip to Paris to enjoy them. With them, you can bring the best of Paris to you. So, bon voyage. When friends and family come to Sydney to visit you, where do you take them? What, what places would you take them to when they were there? I'm actually uh, near the Hawkesbury River. So it's just north of Sydney and around here it's it's beautiful bushland. So it's always nice to take people to the river, to stroll, there's pelicans, there's lots of native Australian birds. You can go on boat trips, you can go fishing. Oh, uh, that's all really, really nice things to do. And the air is really fresh because of the eucalyptus forests. As for Sydney, um, uh, there's so many things to do. It's a very wonderful outdoor city. So one thing that's really nice to do is to go to the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which is in the city. It's a beautiful gallery. There's a wonderful free uh, permanent collection and it's in a beautiful, modernised, neoclassical building. Mm. So that's a really lovely thing to do. And then afterwards you can walk through the botanical gardens uh around to the harbour to the opera house the iconic sydney opera house so you can either see a show there or just have a drink or some seafood and then walk around to circular quay from circular quay you can also catch a ferry to manly that's a really nice thing to do manly is a beach uh so it's a half an hour ferry or 15 if you get the fast one and then you go to Manly, you walk down to a little beach called Shelley Beach, so you can go for a swim, uh, have an ice cream, all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you can get a ferry to Taronga Zoo, and uh, Taronga Zoo is a fabulous zoo. You can see, obviously, all the Australian native animals, kangaroos, koalas. There's also giraffes, and it's a really lovely open zoo. And the best months to come to Sydney would be January because uh, it's the Festival of Sydney, so they have things, you can go to the zoo to see some jazz. You can, uh, there's activities all over the city in January. It's a wonderful month. There's, there's things for all the family. There's opera in the domain. So you can go and opera under the stars, symphony under the stars. Um, so many things. You can go to the rocks, which is the old town. 
and you can walk around to Bar under the Harbour Bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, to Barangaroo, which is a, a Barangaroo is a very traditional, important place um, for Indigenous culture. And there's lots of, it's a park and also you can engage in lots of Indigenous culture through digital forms. They have really interesting uh, history that you can you can find out about through through your telephone. There's little games that you can play. There's also performances there, and it finishes in the new city hub of Barangaroo, which is kind of like Hong Kong meets Australia, mm -hmm. which is lots of bars and restaurants and funky barbershops, and <laughs> and that's really nice. Of course, there's lots of because I work in uh, music. There's lots of jazz bars and concerts, so I would take people to see a concert at. Uh, many of the different establishments or restaurants there's claire's kitchen with that i'm doing a show at uh paris by night and that's a cabaret and it's also a french restaurant so you have a dinner show which is a really nice thing to do really wow mm. and that's coming up yeah so that's coming up uh we did it uh, a couple of months ago and we're doing another show in a couple of weeks and then hopefully we'll do some more and that's a really nice way for people to travel to paris without actually having to go to paris <laughs> oh, okay oh okay that sounds really yeah. interesting. Yeah, Paris by night. So it's just a, a musical tour through Paris through the ages. And I'm like the, their tour guide. And I have Courtney Severini, who's playing piano and singing uh, from Edith Piaf to lots of different figures through time in French history. Okay. And uh, Mark Harris is playing the double bass, who's also in a group called Monsieur Camembert. And he's a fabulous double bass player and lots of fun. Mm. Oh. So people visiting would have no problem spending a week there. They would not run out of things to do. Never. Yeah. And then because Sydney is such a beautiful city. It's just also just a nice thing to do to go and go for a little bushwalk. You can go to the Blue Mountains and go bushwalking there. And the air is really clean because of the eucalypt the eucalyptus forests have so much oxygen in it and mm. so much oxygen. So it's a really nice place to come and think. <laughs> And there's beaches and lots of restaurants, international restaurants, whatever you need and like. And yeah, there's lots of Sydney's very breezy. So whereas Melbourne's very concentrated, everything's kind of cool and central. Sydney, you've got to know where to go. So it's about little pockets. Well, tell us about your book, The Architecture Lover's Guide to Paris. Yes, this was uh, another commission from White Owl, who's my publisher of The Art Lover's Guide to Paris. So that was a good sign that they'd like the first one, that they wanted to commission a second one. And I just got them back to Paris from a trip to North Africa when they asked me if I wanted to write it. So it was a really nice space to be in because I know Paris and I, it's one of my homes, but I'd been away. So when I came back, I could see it kind of afresh. Mm -hmm. So before accepting, I walked around the streets for, for a few weeks, just thinking what's my approach going to be yes there's so much architecture there's 2000 years of architecture yeah. in the city how the hell am i going to put it yeah. into into one book and what's the theme of it and uh, and finally i decided i needed something that was really practical um because it's always nice to you know there's a beautiful building so what <laughs> where can i see a concert in it where can i climb it where can i go to have a rest you know have a meal on top of it <laughs> and, uh so i broke it into uh, I started with a very nice chunky history chapter. So I think it was really important for people to know just that kind of like a timeline from the Parisi to the, the ancient Romans to, to today and tomorrow, even the plans for the future Paris. Um, and then I just broke it down into very practical stuff. So, you know, hotels, uh, restaurants, uh, shopping, but all through an architectural viewpoint. And then just broke it up to categories like uh, train stations, uh, monuments, you know, rotundas and arches and churches, of course, and uh, underground Paris with the metro and the jazz bars. Uh, there's cemeteries, chateaus. And so there's lots of different categories to make it very accessible and, and, and easy to find with little anecdotes and lots of websites for other people, for people to, to look further into what they're interested in. And then it finishes with uh, my favourite part, which is the walking tours. That, so there's six walking tours that I designed uh, and did several times. And by the way, if you're looking to lose weight, go to Paris and photograph walking tours during a metro strike. <laughs> it was a metro strike and I had to finish it because I was coming back to Australia for summer. 
and I just walked all over the Paris, got home and went, why am I so skinny? Oh, micro strike. There's six walking tours and people can also do them virtually, as you know, because mm-hmm. you can, there's a Google, uh, Google Maps projects that I've created. So if you're not actually going to Paris, you can still do them. And that's a really nice thing to do. And I think that's what makes one of the things that makes the book so unique and, and special. Thanks to the Google link that you sent us for that was incredible. I'd never seen that something quite like that before, where they're all tied together to different spots, and then you integrated parts from your book into the spots that you showed the images of. Yeah, so because I've done a lot of walking tours, and I really enjoy doing it for different media, um, and also for my other book. And, you know, they're lovely, and people can follow them. But the whole point of this book, I didn't want it to be just I'm going to Paris and I need a book as a companion. I want it to be an experience in itself um, with the idea that you don't need to go to Paris. You you can bring Paris to you with all these images and links. And through the walking tours, I found I was doing them originally on Google uh, Maps so mm-hmm. people could follow along when I was writing for websites. And then I found that I could do them on Google Earth so people can actually see Paris. And I choose what angle they see it is. So you start at a bridge and you can see you can you kind of zoom in and then I've got my little text and the photo and then you can go to the next one. It's a really lovely interactive thing to do. Uh, and you can really experience the city quite quite well th- through it. And I've got photos and descriptions that, that go with them. Mm. Yeah, that was amazing. Will you ultimately be doing that for all of the walking tours? Yes. Okay. So I've, uh, I've sent you one of them and I've done the others. I'm just uh, finished the, finishing them off and they're all on that link on that rubytv.net slash the architecture lover's guide to paris so i one of them's up there now and then the next week they'll all be there it's a really nice thing that everyone can do and you can do it with your friends you can do it with your kids you can do it to have a get out of wherever you are for the afternoon yeah Mm. wow interesting was that hard for you to do or fairly fairly straightforward well, I've done lots of I've done lots of walking tours, and I've done lots of walking tours on Google Maps. Okay. So I just had to research how to do it and read a few things, and then you know they they take a bit of time, but once you get into it, it's really fun to do. Yeah. Well, sure, it was interesting to watch. Mm. We'll, we'll put that link on there so it's easy for people to access when we yeah, do. so people can 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 participate in them. I've written them down since I didn't memorize my whole book. And by the <laughs> way, this is a I bought this little notepad on uh, when I was researching the book on this lovely little book in this lovely little bookshop uh, by the Seine uh, on the right bank and I thought it was quite appropriate for my architectural notes (laughs) with um, Notre Dame in the background. (laughs) Uh, So uh, the first pull quote I thought was this one from page six. There is so much to discover in this city and this guide was written to help you appreciate the details you might otherwise miss and suggest that you slow down and appreciate the city's architectural accessories. So what I meant by that is it's so easy for people to want to check off the iconic monuments. So they rush from the Eiffel Tower to Sacre Coeur to to Notre Dame and forget to look around at all these incredible, amazing uh, monuments in between. So, for example, uh, in Châtelet, Châtelet is like the centre of Paris, and it was the place where they have the, they used to have the stronghold of police headquarters and and uh, prisons and courts before the revolution uh, in 1788 to, eight, to 98. So in 1808, uh, Napoleon put this victory Fontaine du Palmier, and you can just walk past it and not even notice it. But if you take your time, you stop. It's actually really beautiful, and there's a there's sphinxes because it's celebrating his Egyptian victories. There's sphinxes at the bottom of the fountain, and then there's a lovely column, and on the top there's a bronze victory angel, which is not the original. The original is in the museum, but it's still it's beautiful and it glitters in the sun, and you look up and you suddenly feel inspired. So that's what just one little example. Also, uh, Pont Neuf. They have under Pont Neuf. You can sometimes if you finish a cruise, you can get off and think, "Oh, this is a bit dark and creepy." But if you look up and see these stone carved faces, which are called masquerons. And they were designed to ward off evil. And they all use quite kind of eerie and beautiful at the same time. And of course, uh, a third example would be just all the churches. It's easy to think, oh, Notre Dame, I can't go there. Or, you know, let's go to Sacre Coeur. And they're beautiful churches, but they're 
dozens of other churches that you can just go in, sit down, free, no queues, look up and there's there's artworks, there's stained glass windows that are magical. You look at the doorway and the detail of the the work from that best artist of the time. Just so many things. So I've I've um, tried to put a lot of those in that people can appreciate either reading about them or visiting them. Uh, the second one, here's my quote. It's, uh, the city of Paris is like a museum of architecture from a Parisi boatman pillar through to the through the centuries of contrasting architectural styles to innovative 21st century projects that seek to tackle climate change. So uh, there's a, it's there's so much there. So it's in Paris that it's hard to work out what's what and when everything happened and how it all joins together. So there's a chapter in there that actually goes through the ages and shows you where you can find examples. So from Roman amphitheatres, you can go to a Roman amphitheatre, which is the beginning of one of the walks, and Roman baths, old Roman baths, then Gothic churches, then Renaissance squares, uh, Rococo halls of mirrors, neoclassical arcades, and, you know, through to postmodern and contemporary architecture and plans for the future. So there's they're planning to do an urban forest outside Hotel de Ville, and do lots of planter boxes and there's lots of and turn Le Champs Elysees into like a very green space. So it's really interesting to find out the the future plans of Paris, which are quite green and they want to be carbon neutral by 2050. So oh, that's really interesting. And it's I've laid it out so it's in a timeline, which I think is helpful. Yes. Mm. With this book, you will be able to seek out the city's most charming secrets and historical delights, either in person and on foot or through your imagination with help from the descriptions, images, and links to stimulating online experiences. So that's uh, just again to reiterate that the book is both for people who are planning or dreaming up a trip uh, and all that kind of practical stuff, but it's also very much for people that want to travel through the book to Paris. Um, and there's lots of links to, so if you, you like a, a one of the descriptions or one of the places there's lots of links to the official websites that have really interesting information sometimes you can do like in the louvre you can do a 3d experience through their website and there's lots of other ways to engage with paris without actually being in paris that hopefully this book will lead people to well tell us about a little bit more about the process of writing this book and researching it it's really looks like you put a lot of effort and time into the research aspect of producing this book. Yeah. So um, when I first decided that, yes, I was going to do this book and sign the contract, I first, uh, well, before I signed the contract, I walked all over Paris again and saw mo monuments that I loved and thought about, why do I love this? And then saw other ones that I'd walked past, but never actually read what it was about or considered it or... So I did a lot of walking and thinking and going to my favorite uh, in the Butchermont, which is where I go jogging, a uh, beautiful, beautiful park in the 20th and 19th. There's a beautiful pavilion uh, called the P Pavilion de Sibyl, which was a Greek oracle. So it was kind of quite symbolic. I'd go up there and you can look out onto the city and it's a really good place to think. Uh, so I'd go to all these monuments that I liked and and try to see how I engaged with them. Uh, and then I just ordered a bunch of books on the subject. <laughs> Went to the libraries. Uh, there's some beautiful libraries. There's a little chapter on education and reading and there's some beautiful libraries in Paris. So I went to the libraries, Pompidou and some other libraries and just got out as many books as I could and just spent days and days in the library reading and writing notes. And, uh, and then I interviewed architects. So okay. I basically said to everyone there, who knows an architect in Paris, met them, had mm. coffee with them, interviewed them, chatted with them, wrote notes, what they thought was their favourite building and why. And uh, so I did a lot of that. And then I just got around Paris, went to different places, went back to places, uh, researched online and just wrote through the whole period. So the whole time I was either writing notes or attacking a chapter. Okay broke it down very clearly into different chapters and said, okay, you know, set myself deadlines and went, okay, this, this, this week I'm working on 
uh, bridges. I went to all the bridges, read about all the bridges, photographed all the bridges. And photo and doing photography was a big part of it too. And also it was getting cold. It was getting to the end of the year and and less frequently having blue skies. And I'm like, quick, it's blue. I'm getting out. Yeah. Take out. I remember coming home with my fingers being really cold from taking photographs, but the sky was blue and I had to get that shot. So that was a big part of it. Which was your favorite library? Um, well, just in terms of, uh, the, I like to go to Pompidou because mm -hmm. it's, uh, the modernist, uh, building that that's one of the buildings also that people say, if you ask any architect, what's your favorite building in Paris? Uh, a lot of them will say the Pompidou center, oh. which was when it was built in the seventies, it was like, it was controversial. People were like, it's like this inside out building. So you see the the escalators on the outside and the pipes on the outside and it's blue and it's red and green and and it was quite controversial but all architects would say or most would say it's one of my favorite buildings because it's something that was modern and uh Renzo Piano was one of the architects and they say but it's still modern you know mm. over 30 years later so that was really nice and it's nice and central and it's hubby there's a, there's a hub so that was really nice uh to research in and it's fairly close from my house but also St Genevieve library is incredible and and historic and the um the Bibliothèque Nationale is beautiful and it's it's like book ends it's like ends of a yeah a, a bookshelf at the end and and it's glass so the, sh the sun shines off it and you've also got teenage girls practicing their hip hop down the bottom and okay. there's some little vibe to it. Yeah. So Poppy Duel was, I went to most, but the others are also very beautiful. Are there any passages from the book you'd like to share with our viewers? Uh, so this quote is from the Bridges walking tour, which is the first walking tour. The bridges of Paris are quintessential to the city. Few rivers in the world have as many spans across them as the Seine, 37 in total, each with its own history, style and significance to Parisians. Discover 10 central Paris bridges by zigzagging over and under them and see how they connect the islands to the right and the left banks. Along the way, you'll meet a bouquinist, waft through the flower market, saunter along the banks of the Seine and enjoy a gelato on the Ile Saint-Louis or if you're doing it virtually, an ice cream in your kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So that was just the intro to one of the walking tours, uh, which is really lovely to do, zigzagging across the bridges. And it's the one that I sent you that everyone can see uh, and do virtually. Okay. It's a really lovely Parisian experience, whether you're in Paris or not. I was delighted most about is that people really appreciated uh, that they could travel with the book, mm. as in travel vicariously. Mm. Um, so as I mentioned before, I really wanted to create a book that was, yes, it was a guide with lots of practical information for people who were going to Paris um, and lots of tips and, and information, but very much a, an experience in itself. So that people can, with all the photos, with the links, with the, virtual tours that people could actually have a Paris experience just with the book from the comfort of their own home. Um, so that was really, really nice. And people, some people said that they, you know, they got a flashback to when they were in Paris and they'd always wondered about this and now they knew and really lovely, lovely things. And, uh, you know, I wanted, I felt like I wanted to write to each person and thank them because they were so, so really nice. So I'm really happy that people have been appreciating and, and feeling um, that they have a little bit of travel and hope and inspiration uh, through the book, which is, I couldn't have hoped for more. So that's really lovely. You've also written the Art Lover's Guide to Paris.
indeed. So this is this one. Yeah, that was good. Nice. I happen to have it right here. Uh, same publisher. Mm -hmm. This was the first commission from White Owl, and that was a really big task. Also, um, really lovely book that has galleries, museums, has uh, tips on how to buy art. There's a chapter on street art. Uh, I interviewed lots of artists. Uh, so you can discover, it's, there's a history chapter, so you can discover all the history, the rich, really rich history of art in Paris. But also you can meet a lot of Paris artists who are both international. There's a couple of interviews with uh, American artists, Linda McCluskey, who's incredible, who's based over there, and uh, James Pupura, who's another American artist who's really wonderful, who features in the book. So you can you can meet artists of the past, but also artists of today that you can then go and follow and find on Instagram and, and engage with. Uh, it was a really lovely, fun book to write. And it's a nice uh, balance with the, with the new one. You also wrote Sense in the City, Paris. That must be yeah. your book. Sense in the City was, is, is a project that I came up with uh i was talking with a friend if i wanted to do my own project and combine all my my journalistic skills with uh something that was really practical and a bit unique so i came up with sense in the city which is a series of city guides paris being the first one uh and how to engage with the city through your senses hmm. so it's you know what to see what to smell, what to hear, what to taste, what to touch. Uh, and it was a really nice, how to engage your senses in a city with, because you don't want to just go to a city and take a photo or, you know, you may as well be at home flicking through a magazine. This is how you can go and in, really interact with a city with all your senses. Um, so that was the first one, which is Paris. And then I will go on to do Sydney and other places. Upcoming future books you're planning on working on or any travel related products that you're producing? I'm doing, I can do the virtual tours guided, you know, live. So it's nice to read about them. But then if people, people can uh, write to me via the website and uh, I can set up. So I will actually do the tour with them and talk them through it as we're both on the Google Maps. So that's a nice little virtual mm -hmm. tour. Really? I didn't that, see that. Okay. That, that's something no, new. Yeah, it's new. Yeah, this is just new. And they're, and they're catered. So I will eventually have them where you can do it in a group. But at the moment, people can just write uh, via the website and I can spend like an hour with them, taking them over the bridges and talking to them about them. And and so that's uh, that's something as uh, in terms of, well, I've got the show, but that's in for people who are in Australia, they can come to see the show, which is Paris by night, which is another way to travel uh, without leaving your city. And then uh, my next book has been commissioned, which is Art Lover's Guide to Barcelona. And that will be out not next, like the beginning of 2023. So I've got a year to work on it, uh, but that's, that's, I'm working on that in the, in the background <laughs> and you'll need to make a number of trips there doing the research for that book yeah well they wanted i had to choose between uh barcelona and florence and i'm like oh florence i'd really like to do florence but that will have to be the next one because i don't know florence but i know barcelona because i used to go there every year i went there for about seven years in a row to a tap dance festival uh -huh. so i'd go and i'd spend a month there every summer so I already know it and I know the museums and I, I feel like I could already start researching it since I already knew the city and I have lots of contacts there and I was already have an affinity and know the layout and uh, so I could advance already in my research. So it, it would be really nice to go back there and and actually write it. So I'm looking forward to that. And it's a beautiful city and hopefully we'll get back on its feet soon. You are usually part Paris based. You change hemispheres to avoid the winters. Tell yeah. us about that. that <laughs> that's, a, that that's a nice situation. Yeah, well, I've, I realized I don't like the cold much. <laughs> so um, we're just in the beginning of autumn here. So it's still nice, but 
you know, it's the first time I have to wear a little jumper. And Paris, it gets really cold from kind of halfway through October to sometime in April, it's cold. And I just get miserable. <laughs> like I, I get a broken record. I think I'm cold, I'm cold, I'm cold. And I'm like, this is boring. I should think about something else, but I can't. <laughs> um, so I realized that I don't need to actually do winter. So my usual uh, uh, schedule is that I will go uh, to Paris in around April. And then there's, I go to the Cannes Film Festival every year because I, I report for that. So oh. then I go to Cannes Film Festival in May, which is fantastic. Uh, and then I spend summer around France. Uh, I go to North Africa a lot. Uh, North Africa is good in autumn in because it's when Paris is getting colder, North Africa is still warm. <laughs> and the Cairo, there's the Cairo Film Festival, which is fantastic, and Algeria is what I go to often. And then back to France and then head back to Australia via like Dubai or something because Dubai is – too hot but in the end of December it's lovely and there used to be the Dubai Film Festival that I would go to on the way which is very lovely to pop off to but um it's just a nice place you can stroll on the beach I've got friends there do a stopover rather than sitting on a plane for 23 hours you know <laughs> no. uh, that really break it up and see another city on the way and then uh you can either go via Singapore and uh, spend time there. I know another tap dancer. Some, sometimes we just meet up and have a tap dance somewhere, <laughs> uh, eat some noodles, and then go home to Australia for summer. So summer here is December till February. Uh, summer here and autumn. Autumn is really lovely. Then head back over again. So that's my usual itinerary, <laughs> which is, yeah, you don't need to do summer in the, on a, when, we, when we live on a globe. <laughs> you was at the Cannes Festival also, film festival. Yeah, I've been, uh, obviously not the last year, but I've been since 2009, I think was the first one. Mm -hmm. So I go also, uh, so as a journalist, because I, I report for Australian uh, TV and and magazines about film. So I interview lots of actors and directors and things like that. And, um, and also with little projects, because I have lots of friends also who are also directors and writers. So I get to see all of them. And it's really, oh, it's, it's, it's by the beach and the weather's beautiful and it's a really lovely place and yeah. time to go to Cannes normally. This year it's in June, but normally it's in May. I know you sent us some videos of tap dancing. also a tap dancer <laughs> and cabaret performer and I think it's really a good I like the two extremes it really balances me so when I'm writing I'm thinking you have ideas it's all up here but tap dancing it's you know it's physical it's your feet you're connected to the ground you can't fake it because you can't fake it you can't if you miss a beat you miss a beat there's no <laughs> fake. so it's for me it's it makes me really balanced and uh and I also have a company called Paris Tap Crew in where we have it's this is the 10th year anniversary we're doing a little video to celebrate it right now oh, oh. with everyone tap dancing around their apartments uh, to the Pink Panther another group I have called the Shuffle Project Le Shuffle Project and we've spent a lot of time tap dancing all over Paris in the bars on in the clubs on the bridges I think I sent you some mm -hmm. uh I love to, to, whenever I see a bridge, I'm like, ooh, that looks like I can tap dance on it. And it's a really nice way to engage in the city and it's, you know, create the kind of urban orchestra and, and, 
and we used to tap dance outside Shakespeare and Company, which is really, you know, the incredible bookshop that everyone goes to. And it's just an art form that I really appreciate and and it makes people happy to see it and to perform it, it's a it's a real thrill. Mm. And it's uh, something I've been doing for a long time and will continue to do because there's so many wonderful things and that you can get out of tap dance. And being able to do it all around a city is is really nice. <laughs> I noticed that a couple you had you had other people with you and you were tap dancing and music in the background. Yeah, well, we do a lot with um, musicians. So mm. when we did the Shuffle Project, we had uh, Daniel Hunter and Alex Stewart, who are two Australian musicians based in Paris, guitarists. So that was a really lovely composing our own music uh, because you know tap is also like an, is a percussion instrument. So you should be able to it should sound as good as it looks. Um, and then other times so I've worked with a DJ, um, different other musicians. It's really nice and flexible. And the one that we're at Canal, it's a DJ that composed that music for the tap, okay. uh, OJ. So that was a really, really nice experience also to have someone compose for us. And there's a new, there's a DJ in Australia I've been working with, um, L, uh, DJ Spiral. And so we did a, something down in Melbourne recently and we're doing, she just sent me another music that she's composed for me to tap to. So that's really nice to actually engage with DJs and musicians and do a collaborative process. Would you share with us any advice you would have for new writers? Deadline. Everything is about deadline. <laughs> First, obviously, you need to write about what, you, what you're passionate about or make yourself passionate about it if you have a commission. Uh, and... Yeah, think about it, read as much as you can, uh, write about it, meditate on the subject, go for strolls and think about different ways to approach it. And then I think it's really good to work out what your angle is, you know, what your approach is, because there's so many different ways in. So what is your angle and who is your audience? Who are you writing it for? Are you writing it for, you know, really define why you're writing it and who for? Uh, that's really important and it will help when you're writing and then set deadlines deadlines upon deadlines I can't get out of bed in the morning without a deadline it's really really helpful because you know you can write a book for a million years but you're like it's due here you need to panic not the week before it's due you need to panic six months before it's due and set your deadlines and get to work so either uh, either set a deadline for okay, I need to write a thousand words a day mm -hmm. and then I'm going to spend a month, this is the month that I'm going to edit afterwards, but now I'm just going to get it through it, a thousand words a day. Or if that's not the way you work, you can say uh, three, four days a week or however long it is, I'm going to work from one o'clock till five o'clock in the afternoon. I'm at my desk and I'm writing. Whether I'm writing one word or ten words, they're my office hours. And then at six o'clock, I stop, I do an hour of sport, I do dinner and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then at night, I'm going to continue researching the book, but not writing. I'm going to, at nighttime, I'm going to watch documentaries about the subject. I'm going to explore it in different ways. So I think it's really nice to be stru really structure your, your workload, if that helps. And once you've got that deadline, then you don't stress about it because you know if you sit at your desk and if you get your thousand words and all this, Will it be the best book you've ever written? Maybe, maybe not, but it will be written. <laughs> Structure into your, your schedule the month or depends how long the work is that you revisit it and you refine it and you need to put that also. It takes a lot longer than you think. You can go through a passage so many times you find the poetry of it like it's not flowing. And then also it's really nice at the end to read it out loud. That's mm. a really good thing to do, to see if it flows, to see where it's a little bit clunky. That's a really nice thing. I like because I've got a theatre background. I like to have like a poetry or a something uh, to have a book that's very readable. You've stayed with the same publisher, so you must be very happy with them. Has that been helpful? Yeah. Well, I the, the first one was a commission, and then they approached me both times. Uh, so I'm flattered that they wanted me to do another one. So that's really nice. Uh, they're really lovely people, really enthusiastic, and. Um, Yes, and it's and I've got the next one commissioned, so that's really nice also. Is the marketing for these books difficult? The other reason why I was so happy with those reviews is I was a little worried that uh, because it's got the word guide in it, I'm like, because people aren't literally going to Paris right now, are people going to be turned off because it's called a guide to Paris? But uh, there's a whole series. I've got a whole city of city guides, and it's called 
guide to something guide to and so that's the name of the book so that in that aspect I was worried about the marketing but it seems that people as once they read read it they realize that it's not just for people who are traveling physically it's it's you can learn about Paris and be inspired from, from home so that's good and the the reviews are helping are going to help a lot yeah um and then you know it's just a it's a it's work white owl are good at getting it everywhere so you can get the book all around the globe and you can get it from independent bookshops if you prefer to buy that way you can get it off amazon of course you can get it from lots of different different you can get it direct from the publisher uh i can do signed copies and send them so there's lots of different ways to get the book uh you can have it in physical forms and you can also have it they do ebooks mm. and kindle and all that okay. so they're very good at getting it to all platforms uh so white owl do a really good job at that Okay. And then also people like you who have found found out about the book and want to interview that. It's a huge help. In fact, I noticed I, I listened to one of your podcasts. That was maybe three weeks ago that you did with someone. The same thing. It was a really good podcast and lots of information in those things in the podcast. Yeah, Lou's, uh, Lula Bell's Franco Files. Yeah, yeah. she's a wonderful uh, Australian woman who does a Fran Franco Files podcast and interviews people to inspire people about Paris. Um French people and other people like me that live in Paris and have things to say about it to inspire people to travel and to engage with French culture without being there. And she also shares a recipe each time. Um, so there's, I'll put a link on that uh, web page also so people can listen to that. For people not to feel like they need to be planning a trip to Paris to be inspired by Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, I always think that recently we think oh travel is because I want to know about this place because I'm going to go there and I want to know where to stay where to eat all that kind of stuff that's all very valid but we have to think about travel journalism in the past was us listening to a story about something and being inspired by it and traveling through the words and the photos and the the stories told so I think it's very a very valid way of traveling without needing to go to a place you can still be inspired by the place through words and pictures. Great. Have a wonderful day and thank you so much for this interview. Thanks. Bye.